Thank you so much, Marvin. It's great to be back at CHPC. I'm looking at this. It looks like a caucus, but aren't we finished with those already? Well, it's certainly an honor to be back. Uh, so many friends that I've worked with in the past, friends and colleagues, people who as business leaders and political leaders, as volunteers and advocates have committed themselves uh, to the 1949 Housing Act uh, commitment uh, for a decent home and a suitable environment for all Americans. I thought I'd talk to you a little bit this afternoon, if I can, about where we are and how we got there. A little bit about a few things I think that are interesting that are going on right now, and uh, a few things worth fighting for at the end. So as I, as I might raise a few points that could be considered in some circles controversial, I'd like to preface it by saying I speak for myself and not for my employer, J.P. Morgan Chase, so I don't get Jamie Dimon in trouble. First of all, let me say that affordable housing, uh, as I understand it, isn't only about housing the chronically poor, as important as that goal is. It's about preserving and remaking communities. It's about young couples trying to get a foothold in a neighborhood it's about communities that are served by workers of diverse income levels and housing stock that would reflect their diverse means. If they're priced out, they'll be pushed out to the suburbs, subjected to long commutes, contribute to the growing suburban sprawl. So when we define affordable housing, the housing crisis, as a crisis at the very bottom of the income ladder, we fail to see comprehensive solutions that will yield sustainable results. As Marvin had mentioned, uh, and most of you know, I was fortunate to be able to dedicate a good part of my time in Congress to improving policy and affordable housing, and I'd like to continue to be involved in that effort. In many ways, we made great strides in the 1990s. The laws I authored promoted mixed income targeting, more flexibility, reform of the Brook Amendment, and one-for-one -one replacement. I suggested that highly performing public housing authorities be given more, not less authority and discretion, and I pressed to replace chronically dysfunctional PHAs with tenant choice. But challenges remain, both in making the right policy choices and securing resources. Let's start with the story of 2007 and 2008 as to where we are right now. The markets are dislocated from the fallout in subprime lending, declining property values, and a sharp increase in foreclosures, which we all read about every day and experience. For the past decade or more, an unquestioned goal of housing policy has been to increase the rate of home ownership. The goal has been pursued through various levels of government. GSEs, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, the Federal Home Loan Boards, FHA, and the tax code. And we've met with great success. At the time of the 1949 Housing Act, for example, home ownership rate was about 55%. And most recently, it approached almost 70%. We felt that home ownership would give people a stake in their communities and improve the quality of low-income neighborhoods. I still believe this, but we've got to recognize the limits of this thesis and that some, the subprime crisis, in part, is a result of that policy. Regulatory concerns about exotic loans were brushed aside because the loans served the goal of home ownership. While many subprime products were designed to help families get started and made sense when the underwriting was based on promising earning prospects, they were too often abused by speculators, and many lenders were negligent in their underwriting. We now know that there was a built-in assumption among borrowers and lenders both that home values would continue to appreciate, and when they didn't, the repercussions were felt in every corner of the capital markets, triggering a credit crunch, a downward spiral of home prices, and a general slowdown in the economy, which we're feeling right now. There are lessons to be learned. In the future, we need to ensure that borrowers are better educated and have access to the counseling that they need. Regulators need to help lenders better understand the risk that they undertake, and certain non-regulated practices need to be regulated, especially at the state level. In the future, we must let people make the leap from renting to home ownership at their own pace. We should also ensure that they have an equity stake in their homes from the beginning. The 0% down FHA loan may be a deserving casualty of the crisis. Now, about one-third of Americans rent, and renting is a viable option for people at all income levels, not a fallback for people who simply can't afford to buy. This is true for a number of reasons, because a home is not a liquid asset that can be disposed of easily. It tethers the owner to one job market when better opportunities may exist in another. The economy suffers when workers cannot easily relocate to satisfy the demand of labor where it exists. Moreover, a home is not always the best investment. 
And yet for years and years now, people have treated their homes as assets on which they stake their children's college education and their retirement. We now know that homes do not always go up in value, especially in the short term. And homeowners who put all their eggs in one basket in their home will be disappointed. And yet the tax code is geared toward home ownership. The mortgage interest deduction and the capital gains exemption in particular, and these two provisions are not likely to be repealed anytime soon. The lesson here is that we cannot rely on increasing rates of home ownership among low-income people to relieve the pressure on affordable housing. Many in Washington and both parties from both administrations have been invested in this policy for eons, especially those who put their faith in free market solutions. But now that this home ownership push has run its course, Let's consider some of the most promising trends that are emerging in affordable housing policy today. All sorts of interesting work is being done by communities across America to boost production, and I am absolutely blown away by the quality of the talent and the innovation that we've heard from already this afternoon. In Rochester, Minnesota, they are leveraging employers' commitments to affordable homes for workers. In Burlington, Vermont, they're using shared equity mechanisms to create mixed-income neighborhoods. In Arizona and in Ohio, they've created housing trust funds from assets like unclaimed property. And more and more towns and cities have turned to inclusionary, inclusionary zoning. Under inclusionary zoning policies, zoning permits are granted on the condition that they include affordable housing units, not segregated, but mixed with higher income housing. In other words, regulatory incentives, not just financial incentives, drive the supply of affordable units. Done correctly, inclusionary zoning can be a powerful, powerful tool. New York has had great success with inclusionary zoning. Williamsburg is a recent case. And more than 130 localities nationwide are using inclusionary zones, though not all have matched the success of New York. We certainly could benefit nationally from a forum for local officials to share best practices in designing inclusionary zones. Workforce housing is one of the more promising concepts to emerge in community planning, and you've got people like Ron Tewilliger and, and uh, Homes for Working Families, another organization working hard in this space. Workforce housing accommodates the variety of workers at diverse income levels that serve a community. These are entry-level employees. These are police officers, teachers, firemen, and nurses. Young couples that don't have the purchasing power will come to their careers advance come as their careers advance should also have a place in the community. When the middle class is priced out of the communities in which they work, the result is su suburban sprawl and vast communities. Quality of life suffers, transportation costs increase, which exacerbates the affordability issue. Workforce housing is an answer to sprawl. It provides for a housing stock at diverse pricing so that people at all income levels can live close to their jobs. The question we have is how to incentivize workforce housing and how to preserve its affordability over the generations. A lot of creative energy has gone into uh, this issue. New Hampshire to South Florida are focusing on these questions. In Illinois, for example, employers are providing, have provided, um, are provided a state tax credit for their investment in workforce housing for their employees. Yet another area uh, that's a winning proposition is in green affordable housing. Because green housing makes more efficient use of resources, occupants save on utility bills. Currently, by the way, HUD spends about $4 billion annually in utility bills for assisted housing in, uh, in, in one of many cases, energy inefficient properties. Green housing is more affordable by virtue of being green. Affordability and environmental design complement one another. Building green saves about 30% on energy up to 50% for water use, and well more than 50% for waste cost. Organizations like Enterprise Community Partners and the NRDC, National Resources Defense Council, have partnered together to finance over 8,500 new green homes and apartments. Moreover, green housing has broader political support than other forms of affordable housing because of the generalized interest in improving the environment and addressing global warming in particular. When affordable housing advocates make common cause with environmentalists, both will enjoy increased political leverage. And I can't stress enough the need for us to look out for other partners that have political capabilities to help drive this message for the need to address the housing shortage. We need to look at new ways to leverage existing funding. A comprehensive approach leads the best results. Let me cite an example. 
Many of you may be familiar with the, what I think is extraordinary work done by the administration's Interagency Council on Homelessness, which is led by a fellow by the name of Philip Mangano. He's shown ingenuity and steely determination that has won over many of the most adamant Bush critics. Late last year, HUD released an analysis showing that the population of chronically, that the chronically homeless had decreased for the first time in many years by targeting the most chronically uh, homeless. Phil has had such success because he's approached the problem comprehensively. I might add that because of the fact that it's perceived as working, the solution of, of integrating resources, uh, being research driven, uh, and using private sector benchmarks, that every single year of this administration has seen an increase in the funding that has gone to this initiative. The Interagency Council draws on the resources of 20 agencies. Homelessness is not alleviated merely by providing shelter, but by job training, education, substance abuse counseling, treatment of mental illness, and other factors, increasingly supportive services. The best affordable housing initiatives use the same comprehensive approach, viewing the affordable housing crisis as a symptom of a broader social crisis that involves employment, health care, education, and other issues. Comprehensive solutions provide powerful and sustainable results. Yet in Washington, there's just too little coordination among HUD, HHS, labor, education, and other agencies. We cannot rely on HUD to provide both the bricks and mortar as well as the social services components. We've got to leverage the funding of these other departments. And in other areas, the federal government has met the challenge of interagency coordination. There's a president's working group, for example, in the financial sector that has been a successful model we need to take that to communities and to housing. And as housing advocates, advocates, we should demand this coordination. Of course, having the right policies is one thing. Having the resources to execute those policies is another question. Historically, appropriated federal money has been the most significant resource. But I don't need to tell you in this audience that we're entering an era of ever more constrained resources. Entitlement spending has doubled as a percentage of the federal budget over the last 40 years. Discretionary spending, which accounted for nearly 70% of the budget 40 years ago, now accounts for less than 40%, and of that, more than half is for defense. So less than one-fifth of our total federal budget is dedicated to non-defense discretionary spending. The remaining presidential candidates have all proposed health care reform that would require significant new federal spending, Repeal of the alternative minimum tax would cost about $800 billion, and it is inconceivable to me that at least some of the Bush tax cuts, which are targeted at the middle class, will not, will not be extended before they expire in 2010, also costing hundreds of billions of dollars, not to mention the continued efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan, even if we were to be pulling out in the near future, are going to be very costly. In short, we've got to be realistic about the financial situation, the fiscal situation of the federal government and especially appropriated dollars are going to come in short supply. State and local resources are also going to be strained, largely as a result of falling property tax revenues from the current housing crisis. We've got to adapt our strategies to an era of scarce public resources. So consider some of the alternatives. State and local regulatory incentives, for example, have been used successfully in many jurisdictions to promote affordable housing. For a developer seeking zoning and permits, the prospect of cutting red tape and getting a quick answer to get a project moving carries significant value and is incentive enough quite often to accommodate affordable units if that's what the local authorities demand. Some advocate for additional minimum wage increases, which would boost the purchasing power of renters at the expense of their employers, not the government. No matter how creative we get, a gap will always remain that can only be filled by public resources. The use of public resources will only win sustained political support if it is accompanied by strict accountability standards, transparency to dispel any suspicion of corruption or steering of contracts, and benchmarks for success. Let's not underestimate the importance of bipartisan support which can be won by adopting the methods and the standards of the private sector in meeting a public goal. Economic theory aside, bipartisan support has always been stronger for tax expenditures as a mode of funding than for appropriated funding. Now, I'm not an economist, and I always have an eye on where the consensus can be found. To me, tax expenditures are an easier sell. One of the best success, sto success stories we have in affordable housing is the low-income housing tax credit. It's a tax expenditure. It has worked because of the way it combines market incentives with government subsidies. 
It's a model of public-private partnership in which developers compete and incur market risk in order to provide affordable housing units. In any given year, about 50% of multifamily housing starts are attributable to the tax credit. By contrast, the Section 8 voucher program, which depends on appropriated funding, is in deep trouble. Property owners are becoming fed up with the program because of delayed payments and are increasingly abandoning the problem, exacerbating the preservation issues. As a result, poverty is being recentralized and the policy progress of the 1990s focusing on mixed income developments that can be sustained is being undone. The failure of Congress and the administration to provide reliable funding is undermining the Section 8 program, both project-based and tenant-based. While there will always be a need for demand-side programs such as the Section 8 voucher program, supply-side programs serve no purpose if the supply of affordable housing remains out of reach for those in need of it. But with a little creativity, tax expenditures can be made to work on the demand side. John Quigley of Berkeley has proposed a refundable tax credit for qualifying renters, which would function much like a voucher in boosting a renter's purchasing power but would have the virtue of being a tax expenditure not dependent on the appropriations process every single year. This idea merits serious consideration. Of course, the biggest housing-related tax expenditure of all is the mortgage interest deduction, which costs the Treasury nearly $80 billion annually. The provision particularly benefits the owners of expensive homes, although it is limited to mortgages of less than $1 million. Now, I don't need to tell you that the mortgage interest deduction is a sacred cow in American politics. The, mo the lobbying of the realtors and the home builders in Washington is renowned. But I deal in political reality, not in fantasy. Still, if we're serious about finding the resources necessary to deal with the significant affordable housing challenge we have before us, we've got to discuss limiting the deduction to free up resources. It's been done before. Prior to 1986, interest on all consumer debt, including mortgages, was deductible. In 1986, the deduction for consumer debt other than mortgages was repealed, and in 1987, Congress limited the mortgage interest deduction to a total of $1 million, to mortgages of less than $1 million. Keep in mind that Ronald Reagan signed that bill. Any further limitation could only occur in the context of comprehensive uh, tax reform, in my opinion, the type of reform that is likely to be on the agenda of the next Congress. If the limitation were reduced to, say, $750,000, perhaps phased down over time, it could free up tens of billions of dollars that could be put forward toward affordable housing. And I should be clear, I have zero interest in, in reducing the deductibility of home interest uh, if that money is spent anywhere else but in housing. It needs to be focused and dedicated to, to housing issues. Another source of funding, perhaps more politically feasible, would come from phasing out the de mortgage interest de deduction for second homes. I think we need to think long and hard about what the good public policy reason is why we continue to allow deductibility for second homes. The capital gains exclusion on home sales significantly expanded in 1997 could be examined. The cost of the current exclusion is expected to climb from $35 billion last year to $47 billion in 2012. Any one or some combination of these changes could produce significant sums that could be put toward the payment assistance for first-time home buyers, vouchers for rental units, refundable tax credits for renters, making the mortgage interest deduction an above-the-line deduction, or any number of other uses that would expand affordable housing. Again, I don't underestimate the political difficulty of making these changes, but I think the time has come where we've got to be realistic about the fiscal situation of the federal government, the way forward, and bold thinking is going to be needed in order for our resources to be adequately committed. The corporate sector obviously also needs to step forward and contribute resources. We have a direct stake in the availability of affordable housing for our workers, our customers, the health of our communities in which we operate, and the economy at large. As we speak, Congress is considering legislation that would create another resource, which is, I'm sure, of great interest to people in this audience, an affordable housing fund created by uh, a percentage of the portfolios of Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, estimated uh, with a value of up to about $500 million a year. Freddie and Fannie profits derive at least in part from their uh, advantages as a government-sponsored uh, enterprise. It makes sense, in my view, to require them to dedicate some of their resources, as they have, in fairness, uh, historically, to affordable housing. The question is whether the fund can be preserved for that purpose. 
The deal reached earlier this week in the Senate Banking Committee as part of the GSC FHA reform bill. A substantial portion of the Affordable Housing Fund would be used to cover the costs associated with a new FHA program that helps out troubled borrowers and troubled loans by providing a mortgage guarantee for markdown loans being financed, refinanced. This gets phased down over a period of three years. At that point, it sunsets. As part of the deal, an affordable housing fund was made permanent in the Senate committee bill, and the funding will revert in full to its original purpose after 2011. The House version of the bill uh, used taxpayer dollars to fund the FHA plan. While it may not be popular in all corners of the housing community to divert money from the affordable housing fund, I think we need to understand about building consensus. Instead of using taxpayer dollars, maybe this may be politically necessary to make the so-called bail out, I wouldn't call it that, but some do, more palatable to Senate Republicans and to the White House. In exchange, we get a permanent fund while the House version of the fund sunsets after five years. This seems to me like a good trade-off. The bill passed by the Senate Banking Committee passed 19 to 2. That's a great harbinger of what it will do on the floor of the Senate. And of course, the congressional leadership hopes to send the bill to the President before the July 4th recess. My sense is, in the end, that the bill will look a lot closer to the Senate bill than the House bill, and I think this President is going to sign it with support from the Treasury Secretary, Hank Paulson. GSE reform has been sought by the White House and Republicans generally for some five years. It took the greatest housing crisis since the Great Depression to get it done. It's all in the packaging. Democrats got what they wanted, relief for hundreds of thousands of homeowners facing this foreclosure, and Republicans got what they had long sought a powerful new regulator for GSCs with the authority to impose minimum capital standards and limit portfolios. Neither of these pieces had a snowball chance in making it through alone. To join together with the heightened political urgency of the subprime crisis, they are likely to become law. So what do we learn from this? One of the challenges of advocating for affordable housing is that we compete with a number of other public policy priorities. Gas prices, health care, national security, all of which touch directly and indirectly people's lives. It's all too easy to overlook those in poverty, particularly when they are concentrated in the inner cities. Our task is to make the public understand the urgency of the affordable housing crisis. One such idea I touched on earlier, making common cause with the environmentalists, can help us. But what more can we do to break through the noise? The subprime, subprime lending crisis is covered daily in, in the newspapers and on television. Housing is dominating the political discourse, with the connection between housing and the economic life of the country, which has never been quite so vivid. The foreclosure crisis has created a political imperative for action almost overnight. The plight of a small minority of homeowners is viewed as a problem for all neighboring homeowners, their communities, and the economy at large. There's a lesson here for creating a political imperative for addressing affordable housing, which affects really, statistically, a relatively small amount of people. How do we define the affordable housing problem as a problem for communities a, as a whole and for the vibrancy of the economy so that people demand action on affordable housing, not out of charity, but out of self-interest? Watch what's happening in the debate over, FHA, over the FHA rescue program because we can learn a lot about the politics of housing issues and the parameters of what's possible. Barney Frank wants the FHA to rescue Again, some might argue bailout, homeowners facing foreclosure. His argument is, sure, some reckless borrowers are going to be bailed out and they're going to get to stay in homes that should be out of their reach, but the plan is justified because it's going to help whole communities and even the whole economy. If Barney's able to successfully make this argument, and he's about to, I think, prove his success, it seems to me that it says a lot about the politics of housing and about the parameters of what's doable in terms of housing policy. What's playing out before us is a case study in the politics of housing policies, and I think we ought to be, we'd be well advised to be paying careful attention to it. Whatever the lessons of the subprime crisis, we need to raise the profile of, affordable, of the affordable housing issues through a drumbeat of coordinated op-eds, TV appearances, ad campaigns, letter campaigns, and other means. We need to use technology more effectively to try and coordinate uh, among ourselves and, and build more grassroots support. We have to be assertive about holding public officials to account, whether by scorecards or some other means, for their successes and failures in affordable housing. Let's not let this opportunity slip. We're in a moment of heightened political interest and generalized anxiety over housing. The old consensus about the role of government in, housing, in the housing sector is being remade. 
A new administration will take office in about eight months, and whether it's Democrat or Republican administration, it's going to offer us an opportunity for new ideas to be heard. But to be effective, we need to move be beyond our old constituencies and our old methods. In order to form a new bipartisan consensus for action, we need to listen to our critics in order to strengthen our programs and make them more politically attractive. Again, we need to focus on accountability, on performance, results, research-based, hard numbers, and the efficient use of the few resources available. We need to think boldly as well. It's not enough to make appeals for philanthropy. We need to clarify that the public interest is in affordable housing and the realistic possibility of achieving the, fun, fun, of achieving the fundamental goal of a decent home and a suitable environment for all Americans. Looking out into the, the talent and the experience in this room, which again I'm staggered by, I am very hopeful, even confident, we'll get there. Thank you.